If you've been feeling a little out of sorts lately, bloated, crampy, over-emotional, it may be because it's that time of the month when we visit our favorite website, Everyday Feminism. Here at The Andrew Claven Show, we love Everyday Feminism. It gives us a day off from writing creative, hilarious satire that underscores the absurdity of leftists because all we have to do is read what's on the site out loud. There are a couple of wonderful pieces up on Everyday Feminism right now. For instance, here's one about a woman who is pregnant with a baby girl. It's called Eight Things I'll Do to Raise a Fat Positive Kid. You see, feminists believe that girls feel too much pressure to be physically attractive so that they'll be healthy and have a positive sense of themselves and appeal to the visual instincts of a man who might then get to know and love them and help them have a happy and fulfilling life. Instead, feminists feel a girl needs to learn to be fat positive so that she won't become shallow and insecure but will simply have a heart attack and die. So this expectant mother on Everyday Feminism has listed her ideas on how she can raise a fat positive daughter. For instance, by displaying fat positive artwork, introducing her daughter to fat positive role models, and giving She's killing me, this woman. <laughs> and, and giving her daughter, ah, uh, and giving her daughter a defibrillator. <laughs> All right, get her in here. Get that girl in here. And giving her daughter a defibrillator so she can shock herself back to life after she collapses on the floor. Girls need to learn that being fat positive is much easier than developing self-discipline and eating well, which is annoying and involves less cake. Another article on everyday feminism is called Five Supposedly Empowering Things We Need to Stop Telling People About Their Periods. <laughs> oh, man. This is like setting me back. Uh, this is, we're going to have to have minus days. <laughs> this is... <laughs> All right. What was I talking about? Five Supposedly Empowering Things We Need to Stop Telling People About Their Periods. Ah, this is an absolutely amazing article because it exists and takes up space that could be used by something more important, like an episode list of all 10 seasons of Happy Days or a video of a German shepherd who can sing like a parakeet. Among the supposedly empowering things we need to stop telling people about their periods are periods make you a woman. The author points out that, quote, trans men get periods and non-binary people get periods. And that doesn't mean that trans men and non-binary people are actually women. Oh, wait, yes, it does. Eh, maybe we should skip over that one. Another thing we need to stop saying about periods is that periods bind women together. I, I, have to, I have to admit, that is kind of a disgusting image, and maybe we should stop saying it. Although maybe it's already too late since now the image is in my mind forever. <laughs> Finally, the author objects to being told that periods, quote, embody women's ever-changing earthly emotional and intuitive nature, unquote. She says such claims make her absolutely furious, and she just wants to throw things across the room and rip the heads off anyone who even talks to her, although probably that's just because she's having her period. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this, one hopes, is The Andrew Claven Show. <laughs> I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship-shaped, tipsy-topsy, the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hurrah. Don't blame me, blame <laughs> Cynthia, that hippopotamus. I had not seen that in advance, and that just cracked me up beyond repair. Oh my goodness! So I'm just—I'm not even going to read these things anymore. I'm just going to like have the pictures go up. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, how, how do I get from there into the topic of terrorism? I'm not sure, but I guess, I guess we have to. We have to talk about the terrorism in London. Uh, all right, it's, it's like the hippopotamus in the room. We have to talk about it. Um, all right, let's, let, let us go to Theresa May. This is Theresa May after this terrorist attack. I think the body count is now five people, uh, 40, and 40 people were injured, and the injuries are catastrophic. Here is Theresa, Theresa May uh, talking to the press. The location of this attack was no accident. The terrorists chose to strike at the heart of our capital city, where people of all nationalities, religions and cultures come together to celebrate the values of liberty, democracy and freedom of speech. These streets of Westminster 
home to the world's old, oldest parliament, are ingrained with a spirit of freedom that echoes in some of the furthest corners of the globe. And the values our parliament represents, democracy, freedom, human rights, the rule of law, command the admiration and respect of free people everywhere. That is why it is a target for those who reject those values. But let me make it clear today, as I have had cause to do before, any attempt to defeat those values through violence and terror is doomed to failure. Well, okay. I love Prime Minister Theresa May, and I hope that she is absolutely right. But I have to say, you know, people are reporting from London, uh, where I'll actually be in a couple of weeks, people are reporting that there's just an atmosphere, not of anger, but of resignation. And, you know, part of that may be the British stick to that got them through the Blitz. You know, somebody put a sign up on the... Uh, in the tube, the their subway system saying, you know, we're just going to drink our tea and keep on keeping on like the British do. But, you know, the mayor of London, who is a Muslim, the first Muslim mayor of London, said, you know, well, terror attacks are just part and parcel of living in a big city. And Donald Trump Jr. got slammed by the New York Times for <laughs> tweeting out, are you kidding me? Are you, you know, how, do, <clears throat> how does that happen? You know, I had a cat when I was a young man, and we lived in a tiny little apartment, and so we didn't have a dog, but we had this lovely cat, and uh, it, we lived in New York City, and we didn't know anything about living in New York City, and one day there was a roach, and the cat attacked the roach and ate the roach. I thought, well, good thing, I like this cat, you know? And then the next day, of course, there were two roaches, and the cat attacked the two roaches and killed them. And then within about three to four days, the place was swarming with roaches. If you know anything about roaches, that's what happens. And the cat just sat there because she was defeated. She had given up. You know, there were too many, and it was just too much, and there was nothing she could do. And if it sounds like I'm comparing Islamists uh, to cockroaches, I'd like, you know, to apologize to all the patriotic, uh, hardworking cockroach Americans uh, who just want to go about the business of infesting apart apartments and live their life in the, uh, in the, insect the, the insects of peace. But, you know, this is the problem. This is the problem. As you get, A, you get inured to it, you know, you get hardened to it. But, but B, also, when your leaders will not accept the reality of what is happening, what we are seeing here is the legacy of a philosophy, okay? And it's not just the philosophy of radical Islam. It is the philosophy of Barack Obama and the rest of the left that somehow opening your doors wide, spreading your doors wide without any check on people coming in. You know, listen to what Theresa May was saying. She was talking about, she, they love to use the word diversity. Now everybody has to use the word diversity, but she wasn't talking about diversity. She was talking about what makes us the same. What makes us the same? You know, this is what the whole country is about. E pluribus unum, of the many, out of the many, we make one. How do you do that? You do it by ascribing to an idea. That idea includes the equality of people under the law, the freedom of individuals to act and do and think think and say whatever they want to say. You know, there are people now trying on trying to get Facebook to limit blasphemy. You know, the, the Western culture was built on the shoulders of two people, right? Socrates and Jesus, right? Two people, both of whom were killed by the state on charges, essentially, of blasphemy. We don't do that stuff anymore, you know? <laughs> it's like that's, it took us thousands of years to learn the lesson of that, but we have, and we don't have, uh, you know, laws against blasphemy. We don't have laws that limit who women can be or what they should wear or what they should say or think. And we can't have people around who want that to turn our country into that, you know? And it is about, it's all about philosophy. Who thought it was a good idea? Who thought it was a good idea to open the doors of the West to people who hate the West en masse, you know? Guys like Brock... It, it really stuns me that everybody is so shocked by Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is a character, and I get it, he's this outsized dude, we've never had a president like him, I get it, I get it. But if you want to talk about bizarre, you want to talk about bizarre, the philosophy of our last president was so much more bizarre than anything Donald Trump thinks. In a way, Donald Trump isn't original and creative enough to be bizarre. He's actually just in the very, in a certain mode of, Amer of populist Americanism. But Obama... And the people who followed him and the people who believed what he said, that was bizarre. And the legacy of 
that, and we are living with that legacy now. Yesterday, I mentioned this rape in Rockville, Maryland, this horrible, horrible rape of a 14-year-old girl in the in her high school. In you know. In, by two grown men, essentially. She was 14. They were 17 and 18. I think they dragged her into the uh, the boys' room and just brutalized her, brutalized her. One of them here illegally. This is not being covered. Yesterday I had an instinct it wasn't being covered, and I couldn't quite check it out. I couldn't quite get the facts. But now I've got newsbusters backing this up. The big three networks of ABC, CBS, and NBC continued their shameful blackout into Wednesday night of the horrifying alleged rape of a teenage girl in a Washington, D.C. suburb high school bathroom by two men, including one here in the U.S. illegally. Instead, the pathetic liberal media that's shown no interest in the Rockville High School case complied with Rolling Stone and giving over 10 minutes of coverage to two days in two days to the fake 2014 claim that a University of Virginia fraternity gang raped a female student. You probably remember that. This was this Rolling Stone thing they had to take back. So just listen to this one. Mar- Martha McCallum on Fox had this mom. There was a big meeting. They closed it to the press because the parents obviously were going out of their mind. Maryland is, pa- is trying to pass the sanctuary law that this and they don't like this narrative, right? So they won't let anybody near the press. So, and, and this town, by the way, is a, a kind of a progressive town. It's not like a, a backward town or anything like this. Or I shouldn't say backward. It's not like a conservative, intelligent town, <laughs> responsible town. It's a progressive. And here is a mom talking to uh, Martha McCallum. And hear what she's thrilled about that the government governor said. Well, it's amazing. Over the last couple of days, as all of us parents have found out more details about what's happened. We've all been just absolutely shocked because we need to know how this happened, but not to place blame on the school system or anyone else. We can do that later. We want to make sure that we know how to prevent these situations in the future. Our governor came out today and he used very strong words. He used the words that I need to hear and so many of the parents here need to. If you look behind me and you see these parents here in this parking lot here, Governor Hogan used the words that I want to hear, not the washed down language that we heard from the last administration and what did placing he say? the blame where it is. He used the word illegal immigrants. He wanted to know why these men were here with our children. She wants the truth. She wants people to speak the truth. We had a president for eight years who wouldn't say Islam in connection with terrorism, as if as if that it, terrorism were just some sort of general thing that fell out of the air. Who keep, kept saying, who kept saying, no religion uh, sanctions the death of the murder of innocents. Who says? Who says? There have been plenty of religions that sanction the death of immigrants, and Islam establishes itself as, an, uh, as a religion of conquest from the very beginning. Here's this woman. All she wants is to hear somebody say the damn words. Why? Because once you say the words, there's nowhere to hide. Once you say the words, once you say the words, then it becomes clear how bizarre this philosophy is, this philosophy of not that somehow we can lie reality into submission. Somehow, if we say that all cultures are the same, all cultures will be the same. Somehow, if we say that these are undocumented workers, I mean, they're undocumented because they're illegal. That's why. That's why. You know, somehow it's not a lot. It's not, it's not that they're all bad people. It's that they've all done an illegal thing, and we have the right to our laws and to our, enforce our laws to protect ourselves. You, you know, it is why it is why some of us, even though, listen, I, I really have loved what Donald Trump has been doing since he took office. And I'm not, I don't pick him apart if he goes this way and that, you know, some small thing that I don't like or this isn't good enough or whatever. I like the fact that he is moving in the right direction direction. It's like, you know, Jesus said, if your feet are clean, then you are clean. <laughs> you know? and, and, and to me, that means if you're tra- walking in the right direction, you're doing the right thing. But, but it is why some of us, even now, even with Trump doing a good job that we like and approve of, it is why some of us see a moral hazard in his loose talk and in the way it undermines the truth, you know, and, and I'm not picking on him about this because I think he is largely, you know, a lot of times I understand what he's trying to say, but he, he talks like a guy at the water cooler and now he's president and you know, now he's the president of the United States. So what he says is news and he's got to learn to be very specific. So here's this new thing that comes up yesterday. Really interesting story. 
Devin Nunes, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, the Republican chairman, breaks the story that, in fact, he feels now that there was some surveillance of Trump, even though it was legal surveillance and Trump was caught up in the surveillance of other people. In other words, there was no wiretap on Trump, as Trump sort of said. Other people were wiretapped, and he was caught up in it. Here's Nunes. So first, I recently confirmed that on numerous occasions, the intelligence community incidentally collected information about U.S. citizens involved in the Trump transition. Details about U.S. persons associated with the incoming administration, details with little or no apparent foreign intelligence value, were widely disseminated in intelligence community reporting. Third, I have confirmed that additional names of Trump transition team members were unmasked. And fourth and finally, I want to be clear, none of this surveillance was related to Russia or the investigation of Russian activities or of the Trump team. The House Intelligence Committee will thoroughly investigate surveillance and its subsequent dissemination to determine a few things here that I want to read off. Who was aware of it? Why it was not disclosed to Congress? who requested and authorized the additional unmasking, whether anyone directed the intelligence community to focus on Trump associates, and whether any laws, regulations, or procedures were violated. All right, we're going to talk some more about this, but I've got to say goodbye to our friends on Facebook and YouTube. Come on over to thedailywire.com. You can hear the whole thing, and if you subscribe, for a lousy eight bucks a month. You could watch the whole thing right there on the wire. You wouldn't have to bounce around like this. And uh, if you subscribe for the year, we will send you Michael Knowles' book, Reasons to Vote for Democrats, a completely blank book. And uh, if we run out, we'll just send you paper, you know? But, <laughs> and it's, what is it, number nine you said on Amazon? It was number one. This is incredible. This is, this is one of the trolls of the decade now. I mean, it is, you know, Knowles is like a king troll. He's like he could hide under a bridge and kill billy goats or something. All right, come on over to thedailywire.com.